Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sinead Kyo. I'm the assistant curator of Japanese art here at the Metropolitan uh, Museum of Art. And our exhibition, uh, Japanese Mandalas, Emanations and Avatars, uh, which includes uh, a number of wonderful works on loan from uh, area collectors and institutions, um, will be closing on uh, November 29th as its final day. And I hope that you've seen the exhibition already. Uh, if you haven't, I think hearing uh, Professor Four's uh, lecture before you see it will be a wonderful uh, introduction. Um, professor Four is the Cao Professor of Japanese Religion at Columbia University, uh, which is not too far from here in New York, as many of you know. And uh, he has particular interests both in Zen or Chan Buddhism and also esoteric Buddhism, uh, which will be the uh, area of interest from which he's drawing uh, for today's talk. Uh, he's published uh, many books in both French and English. Uh, these include, uh, his first major book here is The Rhetoric of Immediacy, a cultural critique of Chan Zen Buddhism, um, a book that I'm uh, very familiar with, The Red Thread, Buddhist Approaches to Sexuality, and uh, his most recent book, uh, Double Exposure, um, published in 2004. Uh, he received his uh, doctoral degree from Paris University uh, in 1984. And it's very exciting for us as art historians to have a professor of religion delve so deeply and effectively into the resources that images provide us in the study of religion. Um, I wanted to mention before he begins uh, speaking that next week uh, as well on Saturday, uh, we will have collectors uh, Sylvan Barnett and William Berto who have lent to this exhibition and whose Myoken Mandala uh, Professor Four will be discussing as part of today's lecture. Uh, come and join us to talk about their collection and about uh, the relationship of uh, their lives as professors of English to their lives as collectors of Japanese art. So I hope that you may have interest in that as well. And a final plug, I wanted to mention that uh, beginning in December 17th, uh, we will have uh, an exhibition of the Packer Collection, which is celebrating its 35th anniversary of uh, coming into the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. That collection also includes many very fine examples of Buddhist sculpture, painting, and metalwork. Uh, so it will be an additional opportunity to continue enjoying uh, Buddhist art. So I don't want to cut into uh, the time provided for a rich lecture by Professor Four. So I'd like to thank you for coming and please take the floor. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sinead, for this kind of introduction. I'm very pleased to be here today. As uh, Shinya mentioned, I'm a history of religion, of Asian religions. So it's not without some kind of trepidation that I, I speak here for the first time. And, and uh, you know, I feel I'm really advancing in not enemy territory, but at least a foreign territory. Until the last minute uh, here, I've been struggling <laughs> with this slide uh, series. Uh, I've learned a few things about PowerPoint today, thanks to, to Shinya's uh, a uh, colleague, uh, Joseph Lowe, so I'm very grateful for that. So, uh, yes, and I also certainly would say that this exhibition, for those of you who have not seen it, is really a must-see. Uh, um, uh, some very nice pieces are there. So what I want, want to do, of course, is to look at uh, these uh, um, Japanese mandalas, not so much, again, from the point of view of an art historian, but from the point of view of a religious uh, studies uh, scholar and try to give you a kind of uh, an idea of the background of these uh, pieces that are exhibited here. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, know what, you know, I've heard about mandalas, and they, they have a certain idea of what a mandala is, right? Uh, um, often you're inter you, you people are interested in mandalas for their aesthetic qualities, and of course mandalas are beautiful. Um, 
some, uh, well, actually, uh, some have a kind of psychoanalytic un understanding of what mandala are, you know, some as kind of uh, image of, of the mind, the mind processes. Here, let me mention, for example, one kind of a rather ironic uh, description of mandalas by Vladimir Nabokov. Mm -hmm. um, and he said uh, in, a lit in a nice little book entitled Knin, uh, he talks about the so-called mandala, a term supposedly meaning in Sanskrit a magic ring and applied by Dr. Jung, uh, Carl Gustav Jung, and others to any doodle in the shape of a more or less fourfold spreading structure, such as a halved mangustin or a cross or the wheel on which egos are broken like morphos or, more exactly, the molecule of carbon with its four valences that main chemical component of a brain, automatically magnified and reflected on paper. Now, end quote, right? So as you can imagine, it was not, not, we're not going to be talking about this kind of mandalas here today. Uh, I'm going to try to put the mandalas in their ritual context, right? In trying to, to make sense of, uh, uh, of what they are actually for, for the practitioners. Again, people who are interested in Asian religions often think that the mandala is, uh, is a support for meditation, right? A kind of a tool to help you focus. And of course, it is that too. But basically, uh, mandalas are um, something a little bit different. Huh? They are, uh, as I would say, a gate to the other world, the invisible world, huh? a, a kind of structure uh, in which you bring deities, gods, with which you are going now to identify yourself. This is really the primary uh, uh, characteristic of tantric Buddhism, tantric or esoteric Buddhism, um, in which really the practitioner, the priest or someone else, really visualizes uh, uh, the pantheon, right, the gods, in order to become one with them and thereby uh, embody their powers, right? Uh, and then thereby therefore benefiting other people as well once he's, he's receiving this power just for a certain period of time just during the ritual but at least it's perceived as very real so real that it's actually dangerous quite dangerous and so much so that uh, the practitioner the priest has to protect himself before beginning any of these rituals any of these uh, 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 rituals uh, uh, using mandalas so that's the kind of general context i will return to that in in a minute So a mandala is an image of the invisible world into which one enters to become one with the powers, gods or demons, that populate it. Hmm? It is a true image of reality, an image that allows the communication between the visible and invisible world. Now, the world, this world is perceived as a dangerous place. Uh, certainly, uh, the view of the world, the worldview of esoteric Buddhism is that the world is full of rather an well, and, and dangerous creatures, right? It's a bit like the world of, to you know, the Lord of the Rings, basically, right? In Tolkien. Um, and and uh, that's what the, the Buddhist practitioners are trying to come to terms with and to control. So in a world like that, and it at first looks like a rather big mess, a chaos, the ritual is supposed to create some kind of order, right? And, and, uh, and therefore, that's why uh, uh, the priest is going to identify itself with an order or oriented structure, huh? he's going to put himself at the center of that structure, identifying himself with the, the, the main deity, and then protected, a structure being protected on all sides, on the four gates. A mandala is said to have yeah, four gates, like a fortress, basically. So now, this being said, uh, the, the, the star mandalas are uh, of a rather specific uh, kind, which I'm going to, to uh, again, try to, to ex d describe later on. Uh, while the general mandalas have really rather a kind of s basic cosmological uh, meaning to, to them, the star mandalas have another added meaning, which is that of divination, divination practices. So there's two conceptions. And we'll see, for example, at the end, where uh, a kind of mandalas where really the mandala become very similar to a divination board as they were used in China and Japan. So there's two conceptions, the cosmological and the astrological, if you like. Um, the identification, ritual identifi identification uh, of the priest with the deity on one hand, and then the divination on the other side 
on the other hand, the mandala and the divination board come together, I, I think, in the star mandalas. So let's try then to enter this magical world. And I hope, I hope you're well protected. Well, there should be no danger there, hopefully. We start with uh, the um, so-called mandalas of the two worlds. And I don't know if to figure out where. Yeah, here, it's not. Right. This is really the most well-known image, right? Um, the most famous uh, mandalas of Buddhist uh, esoteric, esoteric, Japanese esoteric Buddhism, uh, so-called Shingon Buddhism. On the left, you have the so-called Wom Mandala with the Buddha Dainichi at the center. All right. I knew I was forgetting something, right? So this is Dainichi. And uh, you can see the mandala is structured in, in this different courts or sections, all concentric, right? All around uh, like that, um, containing practically all the deities uh, of the Buddhist universe and the various classes of deities. Uh, on on the left, on the right side, then you have the diamond real mandala, which is basically the same world, the same uh, metaphysical realm, but seen from a different uh, angle, right? The, 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 the womb realm really emphasizes the process of becoming the way the world emanates from or radiates from, from its uh, first principle, whereas the, the diamond mandala, like, you know, the idea of the diamond suggests you know, looked at this world as a kind of crystal-like uh, reality. So th these two mandalas contain many deities, as I said, and can be seen as composed of several smaller mandalas. Because they represent a process of emanation, with the Buddha Dainichi at the center or top, uh, you have to see this also, as we'll see, as a kind of three-dimensional three structure. So the center is also kind of the top of a pyramid. The deities contained at the periphery then are much more demonic in nature, right? We start from Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, uh, the highest Buddhist uh, 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 deities at the center or top. And then as you go toward the periphery or, or the or the, the bottom, really, you have lower type of beings, and some of them quite demonic. So we can't see this too well here, but if you could look really in detail at the, the so-called outer court, the, the, the outer section of a mandala, uh, here, right, you would see a rather motley crowd there, huh? some very demonic entities, like the Dakinis. I'm going to talk about Dakini later on. So. Uh, Dakin is eating, uh, feeding, yeah, eating the limbs of some, some eating some corpses, basically. Uh, now that's kind of surprising, would you, wouldn't you say, in, in a Buddhist, uh, so-called Buddhist universe, right, a mandala? Uh, but that's wha what you have there. Those are demons who have been kind of converted, more or less, rather less than more, maybe, right, to Buddhism. They are protecting the Buddhist universe, but really um, they are ambivalent, right? And they have to be worshipped carefully, because if you do anything wrong, they might turn against you, right? So they are rather dangerous uh, uh, beings. In the same, yeah, in this outer court, we we'll also find deities like Yama, the king of the dead, the king, of, uh, uh, lord of the underworld, and all these rather, yeah, as I said, uh, uh, dark beings there. So the two mandalas, with their oriented structure, reassert order in the face of chaos. But within that, uh, uh, but within themselves, they already contain some elements of chaos. Perhaps these demonic demons, the demonic powers, have to be brought into the mandalas to better control them. But it is always a dangerous uh, task. By bringing demons within the ritual, Buddhist priests channel their energy, but they are also playing with fire. I'll show you a few more examples. Now, this is, again, all from the collection, from the exhibition here. Uh, again, the two world mandalas uh, in, uh, painted in indigo, very beautiful. Uh, and this is, again, in indigo, but instead of anthropomorphic representation of a Buddha or the various powers uh, inside the mandala, you they are these deities are represented by uh, Sanskrit letters. Uh, because again, w think of it th as a process of emanation. Everything starts in, in esoteric Buddhism from sound and, and, and light, right? This is the first principle. 
and then this becomes sound becomes speech words huh? letters so this is a rather high level then as you go down then become forms and then they become like three-dimensional forms like anthropomorphic deities so in a sense this represents a higher level of this two mandala than the one we just saw before but anyway this is not my topic of today <laughs> so uh, i'm not going to talk too much here again uh we move now then to a, a specific type of mandalas, mandalas which have individual deities as uh, at their center, right? So instead of having this large, you know, the total Buddhist pantheon, they only have a small part, a sub pantheon, um, as, as uh, the, the main deity and its, its uh, um, followers or its retinue. For instance, on the left side, you have the mandala of Fudo, Fudo or Achala in Sanskrit. Very uh, again himself uh, seen as an emanation of the Buddha, the cosmic Buddha Dainichi, um, Fudo the immovable. Well, that's what his name means. It usually stands very very stiff on a rock or sometimes sitting and surrounded by his <coughs> excuse me his retinue. Fudo is often paired with another of the so-called wisdom kings named Aizen, or Raga Raja in Sanskrit representing then the lust or passions passions now i'll return to food in a minute but basically um all this well fudo because he had the center because he is motionless he's clearly a symbol of the center and we will see in the star mandalas the symbol of the center is quite important but again the center uh, the main deity should never be, be considered alone I, always you have to take into account the, 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 the other deities around because they form uh, uh, just uh, one whole, right? And as I said before, because the mandala is first seen as a kind of f fortress or some place that has to be purified and protected, the, deity, the, the main deities around it are uh, here, well, not here actually, but yeah, in this case here, are the so-called 12 devas. 12 gods, 12 Hindu gods, who are seen as directional deities, deities that protect all the directions, the four, eight, 10, or 12 directions. So these deities are, are quite important there. I'll return to them in a minute. <coughs> so basically then the idea of mandala is you create a structure, a ritual air arena basically, with a main deity at the center with which you identify yourself and then around it protecting deities which protect you right once this structure is in place as i said uh, well, you pro uh, well first you put the, the structure and then you proceed to identify yourself with with the main deity and to incorporate its power which then you can apply to specific purposes such as increasing wealth benefit of all kinds or seduction you can actually seduce men or women in some rituals, it's very convenient. Um, it's black magical rituals too, right? Ritual of, and ritual of subjug subjugation of demons, exorcism. So, <coughs> turning then to these directional deities in some detail. <coughs> well, again, this is, sorry, this is uh, again Aizen and, and Fudo. So, uh, Aizen, as you can see, uh, is represented often in, in, a, in a red, uh, with a red uh, mandola, which is, of course, a symbol of the sun. So he represents also the, the central deity, um, the sun. Whereas Fudo, by opposition, often represents the moon, right? Sun and moon. So this is Fudo with two of his acolytes sitting on a rock. Other image of the same, right? Fudo as a statue alone and Fudo as, as a tal in a talisman. And Fudo always hold a sword and, and a lace huh, to to ki kill to cut passions and 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 uh, and tie uh, demons. But he's himself basically a demon, right? He takes one to no one or to tame one. That's the way it goes. Now this cult was very popular. For example, in Japan, you see him carved everywhere, you know. And this is a very beautiful example. It's quite big, right? Carved on a cliff in Kyushu. Right. Okay. Now. Moving on then from the center, from Fudo as an image of the center, to uh, then the peripheral deities, directional deities that protect uh, the mandala. First, before even you had mandala in China, you had this notion that uh, the deities of the four directions are 
demons or protectors against demons. In China, those are the so-called four heraldic animals. The dragon, the green dragon in the east, the red uh, bird, the phoenix in the south, uh, the white tiger, uh, yeah, okay, this white tiger. So the, 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 the dragon in the east, huh, the, the, the red bird, the white tiger, and, and uh, then the, the uh, black turtoise, or also called dark warrior. They represent the four elements and the four seasons and all these other cosmological categories. But they're also real entities, real powers, kind of demonic powers, uh, which once they are propitiated can protect you. Then I mentioned uh, the 12 devas accompanying Fudo. So this is from the, the exhibition here. You often have next to the mandala, in the mandala, or next to the mandala, two sets of like here, of six deities each. Then this, uh, this 12 devas um, representing also all the, all the of course, the, the all the directions from east, uh, starting with the east, northeast actually, uh, and, and back to north in a kind of clockwise movement. So they are protecting all deities. You should know them if you want your, your house to be safe, for instance. Right, there's 12 devas, then you have also, so the 12 directions, uh, protecting 12 directions, then you have the four deva kings um, a, a protecting the four directions, and this one here, Bishamun, protects the northern direction, which is the place where really most demonic power, the north is associated with water and darkness and gloom, so this is really the place that's most dangerous, and uh, you have to protect it, and that's why Bishamun, then uh, this Deva Bishamon became so important. He also became important because he becomes identified with the polar star, which represent, which is the north, but also represents the center of heaven. Now then we have the 12 spirit generals, again, a kind of rather motley crowd, demonic uh, uh, entities protecting the 12 directions, and they become identified with the 12 signs of the so-called Chinese zodiac, right? Uh, it's called zodiac, although it's not really zodiac uh, uh, in this case. But uh, but here you can see they have because they are identified with the twelve animals, right? The the, the rat and the ox and so on, right? Um, they have little animals head heads over the head, right? Uh, so sometimes they are represented just as animal, really. Uh, uh, well, human body and animal head. Uh, this is in the collection here, so you can see. Uh, two of them, two of the twelves, and they have little animals on, on their head too. Uh, uh, and sometimes, yeah, like this, uh, representing the signs uh, of the snake and the rooster. So twelve is, uh, two of these twelve signs. So just general idea, right? All these directional deities that populate the mandalas. Now we move to the star mandalas proper. Looking at uh, the starry heavens, the French philosopher Pascal hol, hol famously exclaimed, the eternal, uh, quote, the eternal silence of these infini infinite spaces frightens me. Medieval Japanese were also frightened by the night skies, but not for the same reasons. Despite the theoretical, infin the theoretical infinity introduced by Mahayana Buddhist cosmology, the world in which this Japanese lived was still a closed, finite one. The fear it caused was not the result of an absence, like in the case of Pascal, but on the contrary, the very real and ominous presences, in particular the existence of the stars, which were usually perceived, as I mentioned, as demonic entities that needed to be propitiated. So Pascal is afraid of empty sky, but for the Japanese, the skies are just too full of not so pleasant people. Prior to the 8th century, Japanese star worship was essentially of Chinese inspiration and closely related to the imperial cult. In China, the emperor was identified with the polar star, the pole star. The latter was also believed to be the re residence, the, the abode of Tai Yi, the great one, the great monad, huh, the one of the main deity of uh, the, the highest deity of, of Taoist uh, cosmology. The apparition of strange phenomena like comets or eclipses and so on threatened the regular movement of the astral bodies. Although experts recognized the periodical nature of this phenomena and su sometimes successfully predicted the time of their recurrence, 
the apparition fueled the deep-seated anxieties of commoners or common people and was a portent of impending disaster. So Chinese cosmology is a form of correla so-called correlative thinking. It rests on the basic intuition of a general network of correspondences. It's governed by the, uh, the analogy, the principle of analogy, according to which what is above is like what is below. What is in the sky is like what is on Earth. There is a correspondence between the two levels. In other words, the map of heaven reflects the reality of Earth and vice versa. Or rather, the stars of heaven have sometimes, sometimes come down to Earth, manifesting themselves as earthly realities demons or gods, or people, actually. This notion is bea behind what one uh, 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 scholar called disastrous geography. The belief, namely, that stars and astral phenomena have their terrestrial equivalence. This Chinese uh, conception, of course, influenced very heavily Japanese beliefs. So in any case, the apparition of ominous stars and comets, solar and lunar eclipses, was related to earthquakes, droughts, etc. And star divination permitted to foretell calamities and also provided a guide for political action. Because yeah, the idea was if something goes wrong, if everything is related, if something goes wrong on Earth, it has to do maybe with the emperor who is supposed to be acting well. If he act acts well, everything will be fine. But if he's done something wrong, then this is shown by all these disasters. So the, the, the emperor or some, you know, someone very high has to somehow amend himself. Now, this is a rather grand cosmological system. But in Japan, this system turned into something slightly different, much more individualized. Mm? The reason why uh, the system was so successful in Japan uh, was that the individual found its place in, its, uh, uh, in it, unlike in the early Chinese or Chinese-derived astro astrology, which remained a matter of state, right? It was has to do, Chinese astrology has to do with the, the emperor and, and wi with the state. In Japan, it became something related to the individual. Each individual now has his or her own star, or better, is an earthly manifestation of that star. Mm? We're all stardust, as it were, right? That's the notion now, very much like in, in, in Western astrology, in a sense. So now we have, yeah, the birth star, or as it is called in, in, in really in, in, in Chinese and Japanese, the star of fundamental destiny, huh? the star that governs your destiny as individuals. And th not only, actually, we have this birth star, the main one, but you have a series of other stars and, and uh, constellations related to us, uh, to our destiny, and it's important to know them. But as I say, in, in esoteric Buddhism, stars, those stars became part of the esoteric mandalas, and their nature changed drastically. They become, as you have seen, anthropomorphized. They become represented like, like uh, people, right? The early star was just diagrams of stars, and very, very abstract. Now they become uh, uh, people, and they become divinized, some of them at least. So they become real gods, and they are now worshipped like gods. They are no longer simply special temporal symbols, but real powers, sometimes of a threatening nature, as I said, and which therefore must be propitiated or placated through proper ritual. So astral rituals constitute major exorcism, in which no less than the cosmic Buddha and his entire retinue following are invoked to keep at bay calamity-provoking demons, astral and also epidemic demons. So let me briefly go through the uh, characteristic of uh, this new form of, of esoteric Buddhist or tantric, as it's called sometimes, tantric astrology. First, it is, as I just said, a mythological and ritual astrology. It's astral magic, which increasingly distantiates itself from empirical astronomy as we found it in China or in India and in Japan uh, before that. As I said, before the advent of Buddhism, the Chinese and Japanese were mostly preoccupied with comets and other baleful stars and their repercussion on the governance of the state. Early Chinese astrology was 
the observation basically of portents of disaster. With the development of tantric astrology, however, a more active approach is taken, one that is more based on speculations and ritual than on the observation of the heavenly canopy. The star now individu individualized anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic celestial beings, God who can be propitiated by ritual. In this context, who cares about the real stars, right? Now the gods are represented as gods, right? So yeah, you can look still at the stars at night, but basically uh, you deal with them inside your home, right? You don't have to freeze at, you know, on a winter night to look at, at, the door, the, the, uh, at the pole star. You can actually deal, talk directly and become one with it in the comfort, no, not exactly the comfort anyway, of, of the temple, right? But this is a major, major change. Second, stars are perceived less as if heavenly bodies governed by cosmic rules than as deities or demons which can be entreated or coerced, depending on the case. At any rate, as symbols which can be ritually manipulated. Consequently, two main types of stars can be distinguished. Baleful stars, whose influence can be disastrous, uh, planets, comets, etc., and protecting stars. Actually, they are sometimes the same considered before and after the proper ritual of pacification, right? So all these stars, all these deities are ambivalent. Depends how you, you deal with them. Despite attempts to, to clearly differentiate between good and bad stars, most stars were, as I just said, perfectly ambivalent, and that's why they are sometimes represented both as um, serene bodhisattvas, huh? very benign looking type of uh, Buddhas, and or as demons that must be propitiated. I'll give you some, some example very soon. Even when they, are protect, uh, when they have been propitiated, when they have become protectors of Buddhism, there are still something frightening uh, about them, something uncanny, really. Uh, to take a uh, case in point are those of Tenkei Sei and Dai Shogun. This is Tenkei Sei. This is first the spirit of a comet. It's shown here eating other demons, smaller demons, right? Actually, this is a nice little Japanese touch. Yeah, it reminds you a bit of Kronos, right? In the West tradition, Kronos eating is devouring his children. But the little Japanese touch is that before eating them, he dips them in some vinegar, you know, like if he was eating sushi, <laughs> right? So uh, you get the idea, right? This is a protecting deity, but I mean, I'd rather not meet him at the, at the corner of, uh, uh, of a, you know, Central Park at night, right? Another one is Dai Shogun, the great general. And this is seen as a star that is invisible actually and that circulates around uh, the four directions over a period of three years each. Like in, 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 uh, during three years is in the north and then three years in the east and so on and so forth. And when he's in, in that direction, you better not face him or turn your back. You could not go in that direction because then he puts a curse on you. He's really dangerous, right? So this created all these so-called directional taboos which really were a real headache for medieval Japanese because uh, on certain night, because it was known that Daishogun was in this direction, you just couldn't go, you know. If you want to go to, to Harlem and Daishogun is in the north for these three years, you cannot just take line one going directly. You have to go to Brooklyn or somewhere else to somehow turn the difficulty, right? This makes life really, as you can imagine, re it's as if it wasn't already complicated enough with the subway system as it is, right? Uh, but well, the Japanese didn't even assist the subway at the time, but this made life really difficult, right? So this is a kind of stars which can cause disasters, right? It's the same etymology, stars, astral bodies, aster, disaster. It's the same word, right? A disaster is when you really fall from the star, basically. So most many of these star rituals, therefore, are, are ritual really of pacification or submission. These mandalas are not only cosmograms, description of a cosmos, but also taming devices in which demonic powers can be entrapped. Mm, they are like traps, really. Buddhist astral deities constitute a pantheon, or rather sub-pantheon, if you like, not only a description of objective astral conjunctions, such rituals were performed on various occasions at critical junction in, in the year, in the liturgical year, at the solstice or new year, or and so on, right? Um, when a new order replaces the old, right? And disorder threatens. 
why do we have all these festival event today, right? Halloween and all that. This is a time where you've performed star ritual, right? Because it's a time where disorder looms, right? The dead as returning or, right? Go from the old year to the new year, everything could happen. So, uh, but also at times of crisis when you have, a, you know, an eclipse or a comet, droughts, political upheaval and things like that. So, the point is, the stars invoked in these rituals, these astral rituals and festivals, were no longer merely heavenly bodies, but divine or demonic powers controlling human fortune and destiny. Now, these star mandalas, I'll get to them now, appear <coughs> in two forms, circular and rectangular, right? Now, this is those are two very beautiful and typical. This one on the right, uh, Kumindadera in Osaka, um, is probably the oldest of that kind. So what do we have, right? You have, of course, the Buddha, the, the cosmic Buddha at the center, right? Let's take this one, right? So it's a cosmic Buddha. And then, well, on my screen is not so clear anymore, but uh, you have, well, let's start with this one, the other one, cosmic Buddha. Then you have here the seven stars of the northern deeper. I'm sorry, this is yeah, something like that, right? Uh, close to it. So they are like the closest. Yeah, the, the cosmic Buddha represents the pole star, right? And the pole star is seen as you know forming a system with the seven stars of the big bear, right? The Ursa Major, the, the in, in, in known in, in Japan in Asia as the northern deeper. We all know that star, right? And you know how it handles, how it turns around, uh, uh, around the pole star. Then here you have then the so-called, I can't see on my screen too well anymore, but yeah, the so-called nine planets. Maybe uh, uh, five planets plus the sun and the moon plus two extra planets, which are uh, imaginary planets I, I will return to in a minute. Then here, third layer, you have then the 12 signs of the zodiac. Now, you might recognize them, right? Uh, the goat here, right? Gemini, I can't see too well. Uh, uh, but they're all the one we know, right? Cancer and so on and so on. This is the Western zodiac right there in 11th century Japan. How did it get there? I'll return to this in a minute, right? Then one further the, the outer court, uh, the outer section, then you have the so-called 28 lunar mansions, uh, the stages uh, of, the, of, of the moon over a period of one year of, of 28 days, right? So basically this is the whole system that, that you find in most of the star mandalas, right? The seven stars of the northern deeper, um, the, the planets, the five, seven, or nine planets, then the 12 signs of the zodiac, and then the 28 lunar mansions. There are a few differences, a few variations, but not so much, really. So they all kind of possess the same basic structure. Sometimes, yeah, as I said, the, the, uh, the, the mandala is in letters, either Sanskrit letter or Chinese characters, like here. So same thing here, right? You have, this is a cosmic Buddha, King Ring, the golden wind Buddha. Then uh, the, the, s the seven plus two, nine planets then the 12 signs, then 28 mansion. Huh? Here, same thing, the, gold, the, the cosmic Buddha, then the seven stars <coughs> of the northern deeper, then the nine planets, <coughs> huh? the moon, the sun, etc. the five elements and the five, uh, and then the um, 12 signs of a zodiac, the 28 mentions from the moon, right? So you get the idea. This is, uh, yeah, an another version of that, right? So here, Cosmic Buddha again, seven stars, it's pretty much the same, right? Um, and here you can see better the, the signs, right? Here, right? The 12th sign of the zodiac, right? Namely the Pisces, eh? uh, what is one? <laughs> the, the uh, water, what is it? Uh, Aquarius, right? Exactly. Capricorn, um, the Sagittarius, represented by the bow. Scorpio, the scale. Uh, twins, uh, Gemini, Gemini, Lion. Actually, there are two uh, that looks like Gemini. This is a uh, 
What's the other one? I forgot. Anyway, you uh, can you service my sign here. All right. <laughs> okay. So this is a more recent, uh, same thing, right? More recent, so it's clearer again, right? It's a see the same situation, right? Pisces on the top. Uh, sometimes it varies. It could be on bottom too, but Cancer right there, right? Gemini, Leo, Lion, yeah, and so on, right? Same structure. This is a beautiful one called Karazu, the, the uh, image of the Hora. Hora meaning the, the time period of two hours. You know, it's from which we derive our word horoscope, right? Horoscope is like a vision of, of the aura, of the, of the periods of the time. And it's a beautiful uh, painting based on, uh, with all kinds of text, of course, based on, 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 a, uh, on a text with the same name that was uh, produced around 8th century in China with a lot of influ Indian influence. So at the, at the center, well, uh, a bit below center in, in image here, uh, you have the, cost the, 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 the main Buddha, which is in this case is not uh, the, the Golden Wind Buddha as before, but the Bodhisattva Manju, Manju Shri in Sanskrit, the Bodhisattva Wisdom, and below, well, here, you just be below it is, is uh, Saturn riding an ox, and again, that's we find a lot of similar things in the West, and, and then the other, uh, the other uh, nine planets right here, right? So, for instance, uh, the, the I, I mentioned, yeah, the sun and the moon uh, riding horses and geese, uh, and and uh, this is uh, Mercury, I believe. Uh, this is Venus, and here the the, the, the two large one look m m much more demonic, and they represent this two the so-called spirit of a comets. Uh, two guys named Rahu and Ketu. I'll, uh, I'll return to them in, in a minute. They are very demonic, very dangerous. Together, yeah, the, the, the some are better than others. So the, the really nice, uh, bad one, they are, are uh, Mars. Where is Mars? Yeah, this is Mars here. Mars, Rahu, Ketu, and, uh, and Saturn. Those are the four really baleful planets in, in this n n uh, series of nine. All right, then let me say just a few things about the central deities again, huh? uh, because uh, what is important in this ritual is the symbolism of the center. So uh, the cosmic Buddha is the main deity, uh, but sometimes it's not the Buddha is here, it's Manjushri, a Bodhisattva, uh, and sometimes it's even another type of deity, which is, uh, um, well, usually it's Bodhisattvas, for example. So but one sometimes the one I want to talk about a little bit later is it's called a Bodhisattva, but he's really actually a Taoist god. It has nothing to do with, early bu with Buddhism. You don't find him in early Buddhism. His name is Myoken, wondrous sight or wondrous gaze. He's the god of a pole star. Then the golden wind Buddha is the one you find most often. As I say, then Monju, Monju Shri. Uh, you could also find Yakushi, the healing Buddha. And the healing Buddha is not just a healing Buddha. He's really seen, if you see him, he's not a, if you see him alone, you say, okay, you know, he, he has a little uh, pot of, of medicine. So he's a healing Buddha, all right? But basically, his two acolytes are called moonlight and sunlight, right? So there he's flanked by the sun and the moon. And then the 12 generals around him, the so around him, the so-called 12 spirit generals, they also represent then the 12 aura, the 12 hours of the, of the day, right? So they represent time and space too, right? The 12 directions and the 12 hours. So Yakushi, this healing Buddha, is also very much a cosmic Buddha in this kind of context. Uh, another one you often find is another Bodhisattva called Kokuzo, space womb Bodhisattva. And again, because of his name, he represents space, he represents the whole um, heavenly uh, realm. He's quite important. And finally, well, there's are there are more than that, but another one that I'm, uh, like to talk about here, okay, I should have done this before, right? Is Nyoidin Kanon. So, Pole Star, Kinrin, or Ichiji Kinrin, the one letter Kinrin, as is known, the Buddha with, uh, the Golden Wind Buddha with one letter, because this is his mantra. This, he has a mantra in one letter, his, ma his incantation. Yakushi, Monju, the Bodhisattva of Wisdom, Kokuzo, the Bodhisattva of Space, and finally Nyoidin Kanon, the, 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 can the 
the form of canon or Avalokiteshvara in Sanskrit, which holds a wish fulfilling jewel, Nyoirin, Nyoi, and Rin, and, and Will. Uh, those are, okay, this is it, Kinrin, two images of Kinrin. Here's another form of Dainishi Buddha, right? The great son Buddha. And you recognize him with his mudra, and his hand gesture like that, uh, symbolizing the yin and yang, if you like, the male and female. Well, you know, it's kind of obvious, right? Maybe not. <laughs> All right, this is Yakushi. Uh, the, 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 uh, he is alone, right? So I, I would have liked to find an image of him surrounded by his 12 uh, generals, but. Uh, this is then uh, the Monju of eight letters, and these eight letters are supposed to be the, 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 the letters or the sound of his mantra, which is supposed to be very powerful to exorcise any astral demons, right? To, to subjugate them. And yeah, one of uh, the left one here is in the collection, in the exhibition here. This is Monju, another image of Monju as a child or as a young boy. He's, he's a very complex deity, he appears in many different forms. This is Kokuzo, the Bodhisattva of space, right? Beautiful. This is in Tokyo National Museum on the left. It's a very beautiful image. Um, and this is Nyo in two various different forms of uh, canon as with, with a wish-fulfilling jewel. You see uh, uh, here, this is a wish-fulfilling jewel. And this is the wheel. She spins a wheel on her finger. Now, the wheel in the Hindu context is not just uh, it's the wheel of the Dharma, of course, the wheel of Buddhist teaching, but it's also a weapon. It's a disc, uh, like the ninja, you know, right? This is so this is a very dangerous weapon. So that's why she can really defeat um, all, all, all powers. Now, Nyoirin is often represented as is a special form called Nyo Seven Star Nyoirin, in which she stands inside, she sits inside the wheel and you have then the various uh, eight other deities representing the eight directions, but also representing the seven stars of the Northern Dipper, plus which is heaven, plus Hariti, which uh, a demoness, uh, a demon representing the earth. So heaven and earth there. And they are there, not just, well, you have to find two explanations in, in, in the text. One is, okay, they are uh, her retinue, you are in retinue, so they are. The other is they are inside the wheel because uh, in order for for her, her or him, but usually she's seen as a female here, in order to keep them at bay. They are demonic powers, and she holds them on a short leash, basically. So that's very often the case in the mandalas. It's ambivalent. You don't know if they are just part of a, you know, a nice the retinue of the, the Buddha, or if they are there just so that the. It's a little bit like my, me and my students, you know. Uh, uh, they are my students. They come to class because, they like, but they also they can, they can't leave. They are captive audience, right? <laughs> so that's the same idea, I think. I mean, something like that. Saying a few things about then the elements of a system of this kind of star mandala system, right? Uh, we have seen them already. So uh, the seven stars, the nine luminaries or nine planets, and the twelve signs of the zodiac, and then there is uh, the twenty-eight mansions. This is an anthropomorphic representation of seven stars. This is in, uh, uh, one of these uh, Chinese texts. In a sutra, in a, a text that the Buddha, Manjushri actually, uh, the Bodhisattva Manjushri explained the structure of the universe and the seven stars. And below that, they are represented in a diagrammatic form with, together with talismans, right? In order to exorcise again. Ooh, exorcise, either the stars exorcise demons or the stars themselves are, are the demons to be exorcised. It's not ne never very clear. Then there's nine planets here, nine uh, yeah, stars or planets, right? So the sun and the moon, uh, Venus, uh, I said before, we've seen that, right? Rahu and Ketu, Mars, uh, Saturn, and who's left? Mercury, and, 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 I'm forgetting someone here. Mercury, okay, well, we can check this later on, right? Uh, that's another form, but uh, but and for and for the uh, of the nine planets, but the one I wanted to just disappear, so we can forget about this. This is Mars. Now this is a very tantric image there, where Mars representing as a kind of Buddhist ascetic. The others look very Chinese, right? But here Mars look really it's very strange, right? I mean, riding a horse or a monkey and himself a, a, a donkey, himself has a donkey head. He holds a wheel in his hand, right? And some weather uh, weapons, uh, different. Uh, Several kinds of weapons. Mars is, of course, like like in the West, a god of war, right? He represents fire. That's why also the the, the 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 mount is red, right? The color of fire. This is Saturn with uh, an old man 
sometimes riding an ox or with an ox on his head, an ox head on his head, right? Another very baleful kind of uh, uh, star. And those are Rahu and Ketu. Sometimes they represent only just um, like as heads, right? And they represent, they are imaginary deities. They are actually, they represent the nodal points, the nodes of the moon on his rising or descending uh, trajectory. So they are not exactly real stars at all. They have been added there for whatever reason, right? But they are seen also as representing um, sometimes the head and, uh, and, and tail of a dragon. Rahu, we're told, was a god who was beheaded by the Hindu god Vishnu. He had done some mischief, so he was beheaded. And then, in order to take revenge, he started swallowing planets, swallowing s the, the moon, and, and, and uh, right? He's a rather powerful god too, so he had to be propitiated. So that's, that's him. This is Rahu here. With seven, yeah, uh, usually seven uh, snakes coming out of his hair. Remember this little detail. We're going to see it again. Yeah, okay, that's like the 12 signs of zodiac. So here again, I, I, I was just looking at those. We have seen this before, right? So that's. Um, in the West, of course, the, 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 the zodiac, you, know, you can see how similar it is, right? I mean, relatively, right? The, the 12 sign of the zodiac. This is from really a very old, um, from a synagogue in, in Palestine in the 5th or 6th century at Beit Shehan. It's a very beautiful uh, um, yeah, representation. And on the right side, this comes from the so-called Très Riche Zeur du Duc de Berry, a very beautiful illuminated manuscript um, and uh, in which you have then this image of a zodiacal man. In other words, the body of ma uh, the, the human body is seen is a microcosm. It's the same thing as a macrocosm, right? It's a small universe. So in the body, you find all the same powers, including, of course, the, the 12 signs. And that's why the signs out there can affect your own bodily parts in there. There's, again, a correspondence, a relation between uh, the, the inside of the body and, and, and the universe. Uh, so this is, of course, very, very important in Chinese and, and um, thought, but in the West too, before, of course, the, the, the 17th, 18th century, this kind of astrological conceptions of the so-called macrocosm and microcosm, and the great and small world, was very, very uh, s similar. In so we find actually also, I didn't find an image of that, but the same zodiacal mind, similar zodiacal man in, in, in Buddhism or in China. Those are the 28 mentions, as you see there, they are represented together with the diagrammatic form, right, of the stars, of the constellations they represent, uh, uh, in which the moon is stopping, at, you know, at all times. Here they are represented in a benign form as bodhisattvas, right, this kind of nice, smiling, almost uh, feminine figures. Here, it's not too clear maybe, but you can see it's, it's they are the same but seen really from the other angle, right, as dark demonic powers. Some of them are really, really strange, right? Uh, yeah, here again, it's like a mixture, it's a very beautiful scrolls in which the star, the planets, the five planets or nine planets, plus the 28 mentions, the lunar mentions, are put together and they are put also in, in, in correspondence. Uh, you can see, well, I, I forgot which are which, but just to give you an idea, right, of what they, they look like. Not exactly the most friendly types, right? Now we move on to, um, don't have too much time left, uh, one particular deity which um, uh, I thought actually we mentioned uh, before, uh, Dr. Barnett and, and, and Berto and, and the beautiful mandala uh, in the ex exhibition and, and they had asked me about this particular de uh, deity which is on the mandala and, and they were asking why this, g this deity is shown with um, um, with a day ahead over his head. I'll return to this in a minute. But this deity, Myoken, wondrous sight, is the god of a pole star, right? Now, at first, the god of pole star in China is rather abstract deity. You just don't find many representation of him. Um, and they are very simple. In Japan, they became really, as you'll see, very diverse. And it shows that this god somehow, the cult of this god became really important and many different groups were worshiping in, in this or that fashion. So this is really, I think, what happens um, when a cult takes off from a rather abstract kind of entity, metaphysical or cosmological, to a real god. Now, this god has origins in the Taoist uh, 
lore and in China is called is known as Xuan Wu, the dark warrior, which we saw before was also represented as as a, as a black tortoise representing the northern direction. Uh, in the Song period, the name Xuan Wu was replaced by Zhen Wu, the, the perfected warrior, because Xuan, the word Xuan had become taboo to use at that particular time. After that, the god becomes very important. One is the main deity really in the Buddhist, in the Taoist, sorry, in the Taoist pantheon. Here is represented at the heart uh, of what looks like a mandala, but it's really actually a set of, uh, you can see of 72, uh, well, here you have uh, first uh, eight trigrams of the Yijing, right? You know the Yijing, the Book of Change, right? I'm sure you all have been playing with this. Those of you who lived uh, in the 60s certainly did, right? I mean, it was the equivalent, it still is right, of the Ouija board at the time. Right, and you see in the middle there, you have the seven stars of the Northern Dipper controlling the whole process of change, right? And then all around you have 72 hexagrams, which represent again the 72 situations possible and the 72 talismans to um, deal with the situation, right? So at the center is John Wu himself, flanked by his two acolytes and um, with the sun and the moon, and you can see acolyte. Uh, so sun and moon, yin and yang, if you like. And one acolyte has a red face, the other white face, right? Uh, but they have been exchanged to show the interpenetration of yin and yang, right? So this one has, has a white face here under the, under the sun, and this one has a red face under the moon, right? But they are, collected, they are connected like that, right? Anyway, that's another image of, uh, now it's an image of Myoken. Uh, well, actually, it has been displaced a little bit. It's an image of this Bodhisattva, again, at the center of um, the phases of moon and sun, right? You have five phases of the moon and the sun, and all these moon and sun are, are carried or, or, or grasped or, uh, or attacked, it's not too clear, by animals, right? An elephant or a, uh, a tiger, a deer, and so on. And he has, but you cannot see it here, he has also himself a deer head. I, I'll return to it later. This is again Chen Wu. Now this is Myoken represented as Chen Wu, right? So the, the two merge into one. Two deities merge into one. Same Myoken here. Now Myoken, because he's, he's represent the Norse and, and the black warrior, the tortoise, he's often seen riding a, bla a tortoise or sometimes a tortoise and a snake and coiled. Entwine, intertwine. And another image, I put it here, that's often represented like that, is one of the ten devas, ten directional deities named Suiten, the water deity, the water god, known in India as Varuna. Very important, very, very also, uh, very old god. And so the cult of, Chen, of Myoken, I, I mentioned it, is this here because clearly with the water association became related with the cult of nagas or dragons or snakes, right? That's another element. Same, you know, it's two beautiful images of the same, right? It's riding a tortoise, holding a sword. He is represented often as, as a young man, uh, as a youth. Here now he's riding a dragon, right? And he has his two acolytes, again, red and white face. Well, more or less, no, actually not. But one is a demon and one is a bodhisattva, so same idea. And it's in the left side here is also, uh, it seemed to, but this time, like here, he's holding, right? the sun and the moon in these two arms, plus uh, uh, what, a brush and, and a paper, right? In which he's nothing recording the good and evil deeds that you've committed, all right? So he's really the God that controls human life and destiny. If you're good, your life will be extended. If you're bad, your life will be shortened, right? Just that simple, right? <laughs> Uh, so he becomes the god of his destiny. Here, you see him again, the image I've shot before, together with all the stars, seven stars as diagrams, and then the, the, the moon now, which, which has a little black crow in it, and the sun, which has little hair pounding the elixir of immortality. These are very old Chinese symbols, which you find everywhere, and again, riding a dragon. Uh, so it's more of the same, right? But here, the one on the right side here, is actually not uh, Myoken, it's Venus. But you can see her again. He benefited or he, wa he or was influenced by Venus or Venus was influenced by, by him in terms of representation. Basically, um, those things are all related. Now, 
the, 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 the Myokan at the heart of all these suns and moons as a kind of cosmic deity is uh, really uh, an image that developed in particular uh, tradition of, of uh, Japanese Buddhism in so-called the Minidera uh, temple near Biwa Lake. My time is up, right? This is it, but anyway, I just want to show you to show this that this is a uh, Chen Wu riding his dragon, and then those are various other form, m m m deities of this media tradition. This is now later on. Then this Myoken, god of pole star, becomes associated, uh, as you can see here, with the poles, the seven stars of a, of the northern dipper again, represented in his aura. But it also becomes more of a, he's no longer a young boy now, he becomes a warrior. And this is a tradition that, in particular, in the Nichiren sect of Japanese Buddhism, this is this so called Myoken of Nose. Nose, it's in the place near Osaka, that's become very popular. Uh, I have one of these statues at my home, actually, very nice. I, I mean, not so nice, actually. It looks rather, uh, sometimes when I don't feel good in the morning, I don't like to look at him because I know he's, he's writing that, you know, it doesn't look good. This is a mandala that uh, of the Barnett and, and Berto collection up here. And so you can see a Myoken um, surrounded by the 12 signs of, of the so-called Chinese zodiac, right, with the rooster and so on, animal-headed. And he himself has, it's not so, so easy to see, a little deer head on his, on his uh, head. Uh, so when I was asked by, by uh, Mr. Barnett and, and Berto, what about this head? I said, well, the only thing that comes to mind really is uh, th th in, in Japan, when you see deers, you're thinking of Nara, right? So you have been in Nara, some of you, all these deers. The so-called Kasuga Shrine in Nara, the main deity, uh, is related very closely related to to deers, and that's why these de deers, although they commit a lot of havoc and people don't like them so much, people who live there, uh, they're still protected, right? Because they are the god, or they are the mounts of the god. So this is a god of the main god of Kasuga. You can see riding a deer here uh, under the sun, and this is two of the. There are four gods of the Kasuga shrine. So the, these are the two. There's a female god and a child god. And they're also riding deers there. So clearly the, the relation with the deer is important. But what you see here are also the 12 signs of the uh, star mandalas, right? So clearly there was a strong connection in, uh, in Nara at Kasuga between the deers and the stars and probably Myoken too. That would explain maybe why Myoken is represented as a, as a deer. As you can see, this is the so-called Kasuga mandala, again in the exhibition here. And this is the deer ups, uh, there. This is the uh, god of so-called god of war, Achiman, with the sun on his head, and various other deities. Um. Now, the last thing, yeah, the mandala and the divination board. As I said, uh, the star mandalas were often used as divination, right, uh, in divination ritual. Now, before that. Before Buddhism, even right, there were divination board, and the closest to what we know as divination board is what is usually called the divination, the Chinese compass, which represent, uh, of course, here's a little, uh, well, this is a modern form, right? But you have the the eight sign of, of the Yijing, and then here again you have the twelve sign of the zodiac, and so on and so forth, right? So the various various um, entities forming the cosmos, and the idea is that by pivoting. Not here, but in other case, by pivoting the, 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 the this thing on its axis, you put very and, and depending on your birth year and some other uh, data, individual data, you somehow connect yourself with other type of higher level realities, other symbols, and that explains why uh, what's happening to you now is happening to you, right? So it's a way to understand where you stand in this larger frame of things, right, and to act accordingly. But basically, in divination. You cannot do much. You can just try to flow, huh? flow with the flow, right? Uh, flow with the stream. You cannot change it very much. Whereas in esoteric Buddhism, you can actually change it. This is the main difference. So here is another form. It's, it's a diagram which represents, uh, actually it represents Mount Sumeru, the cosmic mountain on Bud of Buddhism. And uh, on top of it, you have Fudo, huh? the immovable, this deity we saw before. Uh, and it's around, uh, it's only one side, it's a four side thing, right? It's just uh, on the fourth side, you have the four, protect the four Deva kings protecting the four directions. And then you find here again the 12, s well, no, the 28 mentions, right? So basically, 
It's a view, it's a three-dimensional view of the mandala or the div divination board. Now, the idea is that somehow the, the upper part, the conical part, is revolving. Huh? It represents heaven. Heaven is seen as a circle, as a, and earth is seen as a square, right? So a square part, uh, uh, a conic part revolving on a square part. And depending on when you see, it's like really playing, right? Playing what? You know, playing in Las Vegas. Depending on where thing falls, right? This is your destiny, right? So you make it piv pi pivot, and, and then you end up knowing something about, about uh, where you are. Now, the reason I mention this is that some not so long ago, some of this, uh, in an exhibition in, in, in Yokohama, some of the materials have been found explaining, showing, describing some of these divination boards. But instead of being the Chinese type, they are the Buddhist type, with Buddhist deities at the center and around. And in particular, this deity there, Dakini Ten. You remember Dakini I mentioned in, no, probably you don't, but um, earlier, the Dakinis being these ghouls or demons eating, uh, feeding on, on human essence. In Japan, these Dakinis became one single deity uh, and becomes more positive, so they're represented as beautiful young woman, and uh, she's riding a fox, flying fox. The Dakinis fly in space, right? Um, so this deity now is represented at the center, at the top of this divination board. It revolves around it. It has its four main acolytes, one of which actually holds a pen and a register, right? So again, marking the, the destiny. And then around, so this is on, on the conic part, on the heavenly part. And then on the bottom part, the earthly part, you have the 12, again, sign of the zodiac, the 28 constellation, and so on. So basically, it's the same star mandala. Except that here it's not a mandala, it is a mandala, but it's also a divination board. And it was used either like a divination board, as a divination board, or as a mandala. In other words, it was put on an altar and it was worshipped as a real deity. And, and the, now the practitioner was supposed again to become one with that deity, just like you do in tantric or esoteric Buddhist ritual. Right? So here we have really, you can see all these star mandalas have become something quite different. You know, uh, well, they may have been always uh, uh, divination boards, but here it becomes really, really uh, obvious. And uh, so, resuming, uh, the, uh, to summarize the main features of these born mandalas, first, there is an identification of the two fundamental mandalas of Shingon, uh, the two great mandalas we saw before, with the two parts of the divination board, heaven and earth. Womb mandala, womb real mandala, diamond real mandala. Then, um, rather than being used simply as a divination technique, the board is identified with Mount Sumeru, the cosmic mountain, with a central deity, it also, uh, the, it's also identified with a central deity, and also, last but not last, with the body of the practitioner. In other words, the practitioner is supposed to become one with the board as a symbolic system. The practitioner, the practitioner's big body is become a divination board and it becomes a mandala. It is now, it contains all these deities that are seen in the mandala. So the board has become a three-dimensional mandala and conversely, one may perhaps consider the mandala, consider the mandala as a revolving divination board. The outer courts, the outer section of a mandala are revolving around its axis. Each section of the star mandala with the main deity, its acolytes, and the 12 cyclical animals, the 12 signs of the zodiac, 20 and 28 lunar mansion, etc., should perhaps be seen as the revolving parts of the divination board. We may he have here what a French scholar, Paul Mus, was writing about the stupa of Borobudur in Indonesia, uh, once called cinetic symbolism, huh? a symbolism in motion. Namely, you, see, you see have to see this monument as actually revolving. Now, actually, you climb and you go around it, and you s but actually, you must, it's not you going around it in actual practice. It's it that turns, and, 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 and you see all its image uh, moving in front of your eyes, basically. So something like that, right? That, that the, the mandala is a cinetic symbol. At any rate, this reminds us that uh, though mandala, the mandalas, albeit frozen in their representation, are in fact dynamic, cinetic structures which the ritual must animate, which a practitioner must animate himself through his, his visualization. 
The merging of the, two st of the star mandala with the Chinese uh, divination board in an is perhaps another aspect of the intense remythologization. I should never use a word like that. Remythologization, right? Um, that affected not only medieval Japanese religion, but also Buddhist and Chinese cosmologies. In other words, Buddhist, Chinese and Buddhist cosmologies were rather abstract cosmological system, but in Japan, a whole mythological system, right? was read into this. The, 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 the symbols, the, uh, the, the abstract notions became real gods, real, and, and they, they were therefore represented as r images huh, of, of human, anthropomorphic images. This uh, also reveals the intense concern that medieval Japanese had for their individual destinies. It is, in other words, perhaps, one aspect of the emergence of the individual in Japanese culture. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>